He's driving it and looks for Finney Smith. It's a loose ball and Luca picks it up. There's some Luca magic. <laughs> Ain't nobody in this game who's got a knack for doing stuff like that than the Slovenian El Nino Maravilla. I tell you what. <laughs> Welcome to Inside the Mavs, the official Mavericks podcast of 97 One The Freak. I am your host, Kevin Gray of the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network. Appreciate you joining me here for the latest episode of Inside the Mavs presented by Aura. You can download and subscribe to the Inside the Mavs podcast wherever you get podcasts for free. Give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. And if you're watching this on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports, make sure you like and comment on the video as well. It is Mavs Clippers the trilogy as we get you ready for another first round matchup between the Dallas Mavericks and Los Angeles Clippers with the Mavs and Clips tipping off on Sunday getting you ready for it all week long here on Inside the Mavs and joining me on this episode of the podcast friend of the show friend in general outside of this whole basketball thing that we like to do he of course is the Dallas Mavericks beat writer for the Athletic Tim Cato joining me here on the podcast. Tim, what's going on? Nothing much, Kevin. How are you? Are you ready? Do you feel ready? <laughs> I think a lot of Mavericks fans are asking that same question, thinking we're doing this again for a third time, although much different this time around as the Mavericks and the Clippers get together um, for a hotly anticipated matchups, one that we've known for for about a last maybe week and a half or so, given the way that the standings are starting to look. But even still, the way that these two teams have gotten here, Tim, in a lot of ways been very different, particularly for the Mavericks, obviously, because at one point this team was 26 and 23, and we were looking around like, is this team really not going to meet the kinds of expectations that they would? And then all of a sudden they went 24 out of 31 games, and they're the fifth seed in the Western Conference. For you, looking at this matchup now, what has struck you most about how we've just gotten to this point, given the way that the season has kind of meandered for the Mavericks at times for them? For the Mavericks, yeah, it's it's. I, I think they came into the year a, b- a bit underrated. I, I think that the the disaster, the calamity of last season, that was a worst case scenario for a Luca team with a legitimate co star. Once they traded for Kyrie, there was no questions to me about you know their on-court fit and as long as those two are on the court uh i you know we know that luca is a floor raiser that that he's going to make his teams good but there were questions about Kyrie's availability and and certainly you mentioned the team being 26 and 23 i believe at one point Mm -hmm. uh you know that coincided with uh Kyrie's absences and it's also interesting when when you think and you look back and I've made this point a couple other places, but the team's two highest paid signings, you know, were Grant Williams and Seth Curry, two players not on the team anymore. Uh, two players who did not fit for what they were assigned to to do on this on this roster. And when you consider when you look at that and you look at the way that that Derek Jones Jr., who was side, signed in mid-August and Dante Exum, who basically had no real rotation role in the first eight games was averaging six minutes in one of those eight games. So it was, he was just a, uh, you know, coach's decision did not play. And for those two players who have been, you know, value wise, some of the best signings that, that have ha- you know, that happened last off season um, and, and importance wise, you can't even think, you, you know, it's, you can't even think of what the team would, would look like, uh, you know, without them. It, it has been very, unpredictable the way that this team has been able to be successful and obviously the trade deadline supercharged it and yeah these you know when we look at the matchup uh all three of the games happened uh you know they're finished by december we haven't seen this new iteration of the mavericks face uh you know the clippers who have gone through you know some swings in in different ways i i believe in the the december matchup that they played them the most recent one uh, Derek Lively and Kyrie Irving both missed it. And so, yeah, it, it, we have a lot of questions and the past, whether it's the first two series or even the games this year are not, you know, perfect indicators or predictors of of what's to come in this series. 
Yeah, and just kind of taking, <laughs> as we've gotten the chance to do over the first couple of days, knowing that this matchup is official, kind of looking back at the history of this matchup and, you know, Luka Doncic saying on Tuesday that, you know, the, diff the biggest difference between his teams that faced the Clippers the first two times around and now this one, obviously, is that they have Kyrie Irving. And I'm just wondering, as I look at this matchup, how much more, yes, with the acquisitions of Daniel Gafford, and P.J. Washington, but specifically with Kyrie, how much more does that raise the ceiling for this team against this particular one in the Clippers that's got arguably four Hall of Famers when we're talking about Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden on a team that can do a lot of different things. How much more does Kyrie raise that ceiling for them to potentially beat them in this first-round matchup? Well, Kyrie and, and, and the trades, I mean, it raises them to title contention. It, it's it's we've seen Luka Doncic go to the conference finals with a worse with a worse version of mm -hmm. of a very similar team around him. Um, I this is still a flawed team. This is not a team that is guaranteed to even beat the Clippers, much less uh, you know make it uh, past the, the the teams that would follow. But this is a team that theoretically could go win a title. There 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 are there's a path that that is that is not a you know one of one thousand. Uh, you know, possibility everything goes right. There, there are legitimate paths for this team to be that good. Um, you know, and, and so for that reason, even though the Clippers are a legitimate uh, candidate to to compete against them and and possibly beat them, I, I think it'd be disappointing if if Dallas does fall in the in the first round. And certainly, you know, a lot of questions about you know Kawhi Leonard's health and and on and on and on, but. I, I think that this is a team that that has optionality that that can play big that they can play small that they have you know several different lineups and looks that they can use to adjust throughout the course of a series uh, and and all of these options are good enough when they're working that Dallas should be able to find one to you know be able to win four games in in seven tries and so that's that's the biggest difference and you know yeah it starts with, it started with Kyrie but you know it's it's last summer and it's the trade deadline and it's 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 the draft it's Derek Lively it's all of these things um all coming together to make this in my opinion the best team you know we've seen in the in the Doncic era yeah and one of the things that I've appreciated most about especially the last 20 to 25 games for this team is they have found different ways to win basketball games at first this team was a team that bombed away from the three-point line and was trying to outscore teams during the first half of the year. But then they make these moves with P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. Now they've been able to teams be a lot more physical, defensively much better, and a team that still can knock down shots from three, but they aren't as reliant on that as they used to be in years past. For that, I think that should give, I think, for Mavericks fans who vote and folks who watch this team, a little bit more confidence that they can ebb and flow in a series, particularly with a team in the Clippers that can beat you with a variety of guys in different ways, given the skill sets that those players present for them. Before the trade deadline, Dallas was two and 12 in games where they hit 12 or fewer threes. After the trade deadline, they were eight and two. I mean, that's a, that's a huge difference. First off, yeah. after the trade deadline, there's, that's about a third of the season. Uh, this is happening at, you know, almost twice the rate that it was, uh, you know, early in the season. So Dallas was making fewer threes. And then when they did make fewer threes, they, uh, it, it didn't impact their, their ability to win like, like it had in the past. And, you know, we even saw that against the Denver Nuggets, you know, the, the reigning champions, it was a game where Dallas was the team bullying them on the glass with physicality, with size, that is a way for this team, for this team to win. Um, you know, fast break transition points in the paint. Those are ways for this team to win and defense defense has been fantastic. You know, since the, since the deadline, this defense has, has come together with, with just a couple blips and in, in, in the middle of this, you know, final closing stretch. And that is something that, you know, we'll, we'll see what all these things look like in the playoffs. We'll, we'll see if Dallas can keep the pace up in the, in the way that they have since the season started, but all of these things are, uh, things that Dallas can lean on to win. And it, it's not just offense and three-point shooting. Let's take a quick break here on Inside the Mavs. More with Tim Cato of The Athletic as we preview the Mavericks taking on the Clippers in the first round of the playoffs. But before we get there, let's hear from today's sponsor of our video and our podcast. Let's hear from Aura. Today's video is brought to you by Aura. 
Do a Google search on your name and email address and see how much information comes up about you. I was devastated by the amount of information that I could be seeing searching my name and profile, and I knew then I needed to be protected for not just myself, but also for my family. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. It's really easy to set up, so I don't have to download several different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. I get everything at one affordable price. You may already have one of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on, doing the hard work to protect me and my family so I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to Aura.com slash Kevin Gray to start your two-week free trial. Please see the link in the description. Back here on Inside the Mask. Appreciate you hanging out with us through that break as we thank today's sponsor of our video and our podcast in Aura. Here with Tim Cato of The Athletic covering the Dallas Mavericks to get you ready for the Mavericks taking on the Clippers in the first round of the Western Conference playoffs. And we were talking about, Tim, the, the variety of ways in which this team has been able to win games. And obviously for the Mavericks being led by Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving from a player standpoint, I want to turn my attention real quick to Jason Kidd because – this is his first introduction into the Mavericks Clippers rivalry, if you will, with, of course, Rick Carlisle having coached the first two times with the Mavericks when they took on the Clippers. His matchup with Ty Lue was fascinating to me because as much talent as both of these teams have, ha have obviously, what is your thoughts on Jason Kidd versus Ty Lue and the adjustments that particularly Kidd could potentially make in this series, given the skills and the talent that the Clippers have on their side? Yeah, I mean, you, you make the adjustments you can based off the rosters you have, and and so, you know, I I think the the big obvious one is is small ball versus versus big ball. Dallas wants to play big, so do the Clippers. The Clippers want uh, Ivatsa uh, Zubac. I learned how to say this correctly the other day. I'm still mm -hmm. working on that one. I'll have it down by the by game one. I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they 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 want to keep uh, Zoo on the court. They they want to keep their centers on the court. Uh, Dallas wants to keep their centers on the court. Dallas wants to keep the Clippers centers on the court, quite possibly, if they're getting a lot of success switching onto them, hunting them in switches, getting, you know, Luca to, you know, just shoot step back threes over them. Um, they might change that. Um, you know, if, if the Clippers, the Clippers may go small because their centers overmatch, they may go small because they see an advantage because they don't want safe hiding places for Dallas's centers to have on the offensive end which might push them off the court. Um, you know, if, if Dallas is just easily being, you know, out uh, muscling uh, the Clippers, that might be an adjustment to, you know, it, you know, jazz up the, the Clippers offense and basically say, you know, maybe the Clippers are so successful, um, you know, when they're playing five out uh, ball or, or maybe they have Westbrook in there who's really good at attacking a big man, you know, with a head of steam, even if you sack off of him. Um, you know, maybe that gives them such an offensive advantage uh, that that, you know, it's a situation where Dallas will have to consider bringing those centers off the court. And so on and on and on it goes. Uh, you know, Maxi is also a, a factor in this. Um, you know, he's a he's a way that you can stay big, um, you know, even while having a more, you know, not to just a three point shooter. But but, you know, I think Maxi's real value at this point is is his defensive rotations and he's always in the right spot. He does a good job coming over as the low man and, and, you know, helping, you know, this, this whole concept of, of funneling these drivers to the rim, to the baseline mm -hmm. and, and keeping them out, out of the paint so that their passing options are, are more limited there. And, and so, you know, that's, you know, that, that's one iteration of one lineup uh, decision that the, the teams are going to have to make. Um, obviously this is going to be happening all over the court, uh, you know, with every type of player, every type of personnel, 
um, it's it's hard. I, I can't imagine being someone who, uh, <laughs> you know, is, is is tasked with actually doing these. Uh, I, I think Lou's a fantastic coach. I think Kid has done a great job coaching this year, um, mm-hmm. you know, certainly over the past few months. And so that's that's, you know, a just just a taste of it. Um, yeah. it's more complex than that, but, but hopefully that, that works as kind of a, you know, just gets the brain moving about how these coaches will be processing how these series go. Yeah. And we all know that the playoffs are a series of adjustments from game to game, quarter to quarter, really, when you're talking about teams are playing, you know, at this level. And I think one of the things that we always talk about when it comes to the playoffs is rotations, because we know that the rotations are always a little bit more extended during the regular season, but those things obviously tighten up during the postseason and as i was looking at it, i'm thinking okay you got your starting five with luca Kyrie, pj Derrick jones jr and daniel gafford to start off with with the return hopefully soon of Derek live of the second for this series you're going to have obviously lively coming off the bench along with that's where things i think it'll be interesting because you've got dante axum you've got maxi cleva tim hardaway jr i feel like those four are solidified as far as your rotation is concerned which gets you to nine are you about there as far as the nine guys or maybe 10 that we could see in this series or is the eight or nine that we've named so far kind of the guys that you're most anticipating for this, this playoff run? Um, so I think it's eight. I think it's eight for sure. Okay. I, I, I think that that was um, that the, the hand was shown when eight players rested for this uh, for the finale. And yeah, Josh Green working back from injury, et cetera. Uh, Tim Hardaway, okay i guess you just needed a shooter out there um no but he wasn't in that he wasn't in that eight man unit he wasn't in the you know he, he's at least the ninth man mm-hmm. i've said for a while that i expect 10 players to play in game one i still think that's true i i think josh green and tim hardaway will get a get a couple minutes to see if they deserve to be on the court and you know hopefully for dallas they do and you know for at this point you know i I think there's situationally you might want Josh Green out there situationally. You might want Tim Hardaway out there, uh, you know, just depending on what's happening in the game. But I don't think there's any guarantee those two stick in the rotation. If, if, you know, their minutes early in the series don't go well, Um, it's possible. Dallas is just using an eight man rotation. I, I still think it will be 10 initially, but those are the eight Dallas trusts and most wants to play and where it goes from there is going to be determined by what's happening on the court what's happening performance wise you know if, if if there is a role player that's going through a shooting slump that's when you might you know try josh green for a little bit more tim hardaway a little bit more um you know or if maxi is, is isn't working if you have to go small you know these are all scenarios where you know those players are useful and they, and they need to need to be ready and, and hopefully be able to perform but uh it's an eight-man rotation you know there just might be some you know some reason and and purpose for josh green and tim hardaway to get out there as well uh we'll just have to see how that goes yeah it's going to be interesting how kid uses those lineups and those rotations given some of the specific skills that these guys have and what they could present or not have to present in this series when taking on the Clippers and thinking about a couple of the matchups, you know, one that really fascinates me and I'm really curious on your thoughts on this because I'm looking at, okay, PJ Washington, Derek Jones, Jr., Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. I feel like those four guys specifically with Washington and Jones taking on the defensive assignments against Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, where I get a little, you know, concerned is, Okay, James Harden is kind of an X factor in all of this. Russell Westbrook going to be coming off the bench doing his thing there. Who are you having guard at James Harden, particularly, let's say, for best case scenario for the Clippers in this case, they get that version of James Harden that is the guy that can score, can distribute, and make things happen for other teammates. How are you trying to go about defending a James Harden given the other two guys that you've got to really pay attention to in this series? As always, and, and we all know this, it's it's a little too simplistic to just say, well, okay, well, this guy's guarding this this other guy. You know, the the way modern yeah. M- NBA defenses work is that switch everything. James Harden, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's going to be sometimes it's going to be switching. Sometimes you know James Harden. You know, one one reason the the Clippers stay big is that James Harden likes a a center to roll with him. You know, to set picks for him. Sometimes Dallas is going to come out and blitz that. Sometimes they're they're just going to switch it. You know, they're gonna they're gonna see if James Harden in the year 2024 
still has the ability to do anything other than you know shoot a step back three against a center um you know and i i think in 2024 a lot of you know that version of james harden uh shooting a contested step back is is probably a win for dallas Mm -hmm. we'll see that could easily change yeah even on a game-to-game basis um, but but it's definitely a win if, if he's not driving by them and getting into the pain or getting into the the rim, uh, getting to the rim. Uh, certainly, he's you know become a a creator, a connector, a you know bunch more of a point guard for them uh, for the for this Clippers lineup. And being able to disrupt that that is something Dallas wants to do. We've seen Dante Axum uh, back when he was last in the NBA did a really good job guarding uh, James Harden, and so you know that's a player that you're going to see a lot on on Harden um but but I think you're going to see Derek Jones rotate over if he needs to uh there's going to be scenarios for that there's going to be bench lineups or or partial starter partial bench lineups where Derek Jones is on the floor and uh so is Kawhi and so is James Harden but Paul George isn't out there and then all of a sudden Derek Jones is is a great player to to put on James Harden for a few minutes uh you know and maybe PJ Washington or Maxi is out there to to handle uh Kawhi so all of these things are, you know, it, it will be a moving, shifting thing. And sometimes Luca and Kyrie are going to have to guard, uh, especially when the starting five, when Dallas is starting five is matched mm-hmm. up against the Clippers starting five, Luca and Kyrie are going to have to guard. They're, they're going to have to move their feet. They're going to have to, you know, be where they need to be. Um, I, I think Luca has been decent. He's, he is always going to be somewhat limited as a defensive player in isolation against quicker players. Um, you know, I, I think I would much rather see him take a few possessions on Paul George or Kawhi than than uh, you know James Harden. But you know, that's more the James Harden in the past. Um, sure. And and so uh, you know, just as important, they're going to have to make their rotations and they're going to have to get to get out to the corner shooters. And you know, so so this is going to be a a roster wide buy in, but. If it were very simple, uh, my answer would be Dante Axum because I think that's the perfect type of player to play against James Harden. And, you know, when Dal- when Harden is being guarded by Axum, I think Dallas is going to feel really good. Yeah, Axum with his length and physicality on the defensive end. This version of James Harden may be a little bit more bothered by that, given some of the things that he's trying to do from a, a skill set standpoint that helps him be successful with this Clippers team. And, you know, we were detailing a little bit earlier the two paths in which this teams have gotten here for the third time for the Clippers. At one point, they went on a 26 of 31 run where they went 26 and five in 31 games. Looked like the best team outside of Boston in the league. Mavericks in the most meaningful games. Yes, they finished 16 and four, but in the meaningful games, went 16 and two and had the best defense in the league. I feel like something's got to give here because. Look at Luca, for example. He's now facing his team for a third time. Has had massive playoff success against him individually, but team wise, hasn't been able to do it. For the Clippers, they're at a point where they may be having some things change from an organizational standpoint, you know, going into the summer. In your mind, who needs this series more between the Mavericks and the Clippers, given where the direction of these two teams are and what may be happening for them? Ooh, I mean, they both do for their own reasons. I, I you yeah. know, they can, I, I guess who wins <laughs> because, <laughs> because both, both, both teams need, need it, you know, both teams absolutely, yeah. you know, need to win for various reasons. So I, so I guess whichever one really wants it more, you know, go have them, you know, if only there is a way to, to break this, you know, figure it out. Uh, may, may I suggest a uh, best of uh, best of seven? series that, 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 that on the court. maybe that yeah, could that be the tiebreaker <laughs> between who deserves the series more um you know that's that's my best guess it, it i i don't think i think there's scenarios where dallas can lose in the first round and it's not a total disaster if, if, if we see the best version of the clippers and we see the best version of dallas and those two teams going against each other it just happens to come down to la I think that's a disappointing end to the to the to the Mavericks uh, season, but I think it is a somewhat understandable one. And and then you get to build off that playoff performance, build off the way that they finished the season, uh, the the trades that they made. You get to build on all of that going into next year. That is an outcome that I would view as acceptable or understandable or explainable for Dallas. For you know anything else, any other scenario where they this team just is not as good as we expected them to be uh where they lose to a clippers 
team that is not quite as good as you know that that incredible run that they they were on that's super disappointing and that in you know the ways that that would happen i think will lead to big questions about you know whether these role players are still good enough i i do think this is the best team i do think you know in in the luca era i do think that this is the um you know that the team is on the right path and it has a lot of the players uh to be on this path but you know are are any of these role players like top 100 players in the nba this is their like like i was looking at the the ringer does the top 100 players of the nba Mm -hmm. and there's there's two mavericks on it it's luca and Kyrie. that's it and yeah (laughs) and so i i think that you can make a case for a few players on dallas to be in the top 100 but this is their chance to prove it because if they go into the playoffs and they can't beat the clippers uh, in anything other, you know, in any sort of result that's disappointing, then then yeah, I you know maybe the national media is, is right about these guys looking them up and down the roster, and and you know maybe it is correct to say that you know they're you know despite having more help, uh, that the help is not enough or or is not quite as much as we thought it was around Luca and Kyrie. Um, you know, we'll have to see if the scenario plays out. Um, you know what exactly caused it and and that's where the questions will come from but that to me is is a pretty obvious way that this could become disappointing i don't expect that to happen um but yeah you know that's that's the worst case scenario so hopefully your next question is optimistic uh to to to, to balance this out and end on a end on a better note (laughs) and the only reason why i asked that is because i'm thinking about it from the clipper standpoint of Look, if they don't get this done with this group here, there isn't necessarily a scenario where they would feel good about bringing all of these guys back in Paul George in particular, who may find himself and James Harden may find themselves wanting to do something different. And for Luca and this group, they got the arena like, next year. They got to. I mean, they, they, you would think so because Balmer got all that money to be able to help keep that group together. But at the same time, you never know how James Harden or Paul George may feel about their situation, particularly when Kawhi has been the healthiest he's been in quite some time, even with missing the last eight or so games, you know, to end the season. And for Luca, as we end today, I'm, I'm fascinated with him because we've watched him grow and mature in front of our eyes. And having gone through this team twice and not having beaten him, now he has kind of a third chance to be able to do it. And the example that I keep thinking of, remember when Michael Jordan had to go through the Detroit Pistons for all those years and he couldn't break through and he couldn't break through and he finally was able to do so. And of course that skyrocketed him to, you know, his championships and everything else. I feel like for Luca, this is his Detroit Pistons. Like he's got to get through the Clippers at some point, because even when they made to the Mr. Conference finals, it was the jazz and the Suns before they ultimately lost to the Warriors. And I'm just, interested in his perspective and what your thoughts are on how he is approaching this given this obstacle that he keeps coming across at this point in the postseason i like that i like that yeah i mean i don't think he thinks about it that way no yeah (laughs) i'll I'll say that but i think that's a (laughs) i think that's a nice way to think about it and i think i think it's good framing for his career I, i think there's a lot narratively to to really enjoy about this series um you know i've i've heard some people fans media members uh kind of groan about it and be like oh no not this again i think it's fun <laughs> i think it's enjoyable to you know there, there's not a lot of comparisons honestly uh on the court itself between where these two teams were a few years ago when they played each other and, and where they are now uh not a lot of comparisons at all i'm gonna be honest but i i do think that there's a lot of comparatives narratively and i think that's absolutely one of them is that um, you know, if if this is Luca's best team and if this is the best version of Luca, two things I believe to be true. The second one, absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, you know, now here is that opponent again, and and this is the measuring stick. You know, it wasn't good enough a couple of years ago, and yeah, the Clippers are a little bit different. Is it good enough now? Are we right? Is is this really the best versions of of these two? You know, player and team, individual and and collective that we uh, we believe them to be. And so I, I think that's something that the series is going to show. So I need your prediction then. How do the Mavericks get this done against the Clippers finally? I mean, it's it's impossible to do without Kawhi, right? Can I do? <laughs> can I do a? I, I have. So this is the. I haven't even thought about an actual. I can give you predictions. I, I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm going to put asterisks next to them. I, I get to sure. chase them later. But I can give yeah. you a. What's what's the Kawhi injury scenario that he doesn't play at all or like? That he misses two one, games. One with him and one where he is there for well, most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, one one with him, and then one where he's like iffy. And I think mm-hmm. I think if he misses even one game and is somewhat iffy with this injury, I think it's um. I, I mean, yeah, Dallas and five, Dallas and five, and a Kawhi Ooh, injury situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if they're missing their best player, it it might you know two very good teams. I, I the think Clippers have been pretty good without Kawhi throughout the course of the season at times. So I'm, I, that's that's they have been. for me. That's fairly bold that you would think that in in five that the the Mavs could do this without even with Kawhi missing one game in that way. Yeah, and then and then otherwise I've I've got I've probably Dallas and seven, six. Okay. I'd say Dallas and seven in a in a in a healthy Kawhi situation. Nice long series once again between the Mavericks and the Clippers. Something that we're used. I could to see at this it quicker. Point. I, I I really could. I, I do think I do. I would pick Dallas in this series. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's guaranteed. I, I, I there are ways that I can see the Clippers winning. And, yeah. and there are there are outcomes, you know, especially involving these role players and, and, you know, the idea whether this is the best Dallas team that could lead to them losing. But but I, I, I got Dallas in the series. I think they have more ways that are all well suited to, you know, being better than what the Clippers uh do so hot stuff from tim cato when it comes to the mavericks clippers and what they got going in this series tim tell the folks when they can find you what you got going on man uh on twitter on <laughs> on the athletic on all these places i'm on your podcast check out uh check out my podcast check out your podcast my podcast the only mavericks podcast um all those places People are listening to this. They know. They know where to find me. <laughs> but we got to let the folks know who may be coming in for the very first time as Mavericks or Clippers fans that, hey, Tim Cato does incredible work for the athletic covering the Dallas Mavericks. And for a third time, we'll be covering a Mavericks Clippers playoff series. He's so excited about this. I can tell right now. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Tim, thank you so much for the time, man. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. No problem. That'll do it for this episode of Inside the Mavs. Again, thank you to Tim Cato of The Athletic covering the Dallas Mavericks for joining me here on this episode. Make sure you like and comment on the video if you're watching this on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports. And if you're listening to the podcast, download and subscribe to Inside the Mavs, the official Mavericks podcast of 97 on the Freak, wherever you get your podcast for free. Give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. More episodes this week. I've got a whole bunch of my friends coming in between Is Talk Franco, Mark Followell, and you never know who else may be joining me here this week to get you ready for the Mavericks and the Clippers. So make sure you're locked in with us here on Inside the Mavs. Until next time, I'll talk to you later. Peace.